Hello, uh, it is me. I am Bill, and uh, this is How to Diorama with Scale Modelcraft. And thanks very, very much for coming by today. Um, okay, so typically what I do is I come in here and I've got a few slides and then blah, blah, blah. Uh, sometimes I do a live demo. Today I'm doing a live demo. So I'm pretty excited about that. I'm trying to get my glasses adjusted here properly. But thank you for coming in. Um, I've also got Oscar. He wrote us a little timer thing or like a, a little banner, I guess it is, uh, down there. So if you would like and subscribe, that would be really cool. Um, that's actually a reminder for me to say it. Um, so I'm going to turn that off, though. I can do that. And I've got some folks in here. So we've got Paul. Paul, hello. Thank you very much for coming in. I appreciate that. And, and Mick Studio is here. Now, uh, it's Michael, but I don't know if you go by Mick because my father-in-law goes by Mikko. So you, you may go by Mick, so I would love to call you what you prefer. So thanks very much for coming in. Um, and there's Mikko. Or see, now I'm calling you Mikko, like my father-in-law's name, but I, I believe it's Mick. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And later on, we have some pictures because um, uh, Michael sent us Mike. Okay, there we go. He he confirmed down below, so it's Mike. So Mike sent us some pictures and a little bit of a mail, uh, and and I got to make sure I pull that up later on uh, as we're doing other stuff, so I can read his mail because it was really nice. It was really cool, and and I love his images. He's he's doing um, scale building and scratch building, which I absolutely love, as you know. Um, uh, Mark Nelson is here. Hello, hello. Very 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 nice to see you, Mark. Uh, he is all the way in Australia, and and I think Mike is also in the UK. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming by. I really do appreciate it. Um, First Last is here. Hello. Uh, just want to give a hello at the beginning. Good to see you as well. Thanks very much, First Last. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, there's Mike confirming that it's Mike. Thank you very much. And again, he is going to have some pictures. Hello, there is Neil. Thank you very much for coming on, Neil. Neil Bullard is also... I mean, he is like my my vision of what I, I, I hope to become as a builder because how he constructs his stuff and the photos. Now, uh, Neil and I have talked a few times and he's going to be coming on the show sometime. I don't know if it'd be like live or we recorded or whatever, but he's going to be sending me some of his images and and we we're going to have those kind of like we're going to have Mike. But I, I'm hoping that we'll have Neil on because Neil's really taken it beyond well beyond even what I'm trying to do. And, and I think it's the, the, the direction I'd like to go because, I mean, he uses smoke and he uses atmosphere and has really set up his really amazing World War I dioramas where you're seeing the scene that he's done and it's exquisite. But then when you see the atmosphere with the smoke and the lighting and the... Oh, amazing. So... I, I I know I've been kind of teasing that for a while, but, you know, we're just coordinating, but it's amazing. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to that and I hope you are too. Uh, but we're also going to see mixed, uh, Mike's stuff today. Um, I'm from UK, but live in Pennsylvania. Perfect. So um, uh, Mike is living in uh, PA right now. So he is on the East Coast. So it's a little bit late your time. So I hope it's uh, it's good. This might go a little long. I don't know why, but I have like 93 slides today, but I, I hope you like them. They're really fun. And we're going to do the live demo. The live demo is going to be um, on how to, you know, carve the pants. Basically, that's what I just carved from a British World War I soldier, from a British World War II soldier, sorry, to a British World War I soldier. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It really helps because... The World War I soldiers are a little bit hard to find. And it's not like there's a whole slew of British World War II soldiers. But between the two, the grouping of both, if you have a way to modify it, I figure, heck, that's positive. You got more poses. You've got more kits, you know, available. And so far, it's been a pretty simple modification. I'm only doing the pants. And there may be some stuff with the webbing and the gear. My guys are going to be kind of stripped down because they're working indoors, you know, inside the tunnels and inside the things in the in the World War One trench that I'm creating. But anyway, we'll get there, and I think you'll like it. So uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun too. Um, 
just working in a new section now. That's really cool. And I've seen some of your recent uh, pictures, Neil. Fantastic. He also did, and, and frankly, folks, if anybody that is here on the call today, if you have a channel, if you have contact information, if you have a link that you'd like to share, please go ahead. Um, I, I can edit it if it's like, you know, you're not thinking right. But if if you've got a nice thing, I would love to, to feature it because I want more people to be able to see what you're doing too. Just like Mike sent in today, some pictures at the end we're going to look at. I want to show your stuff, but also I want people to go to your sites and see it. So Neil's got a great uh, website and I'll try to include that at the end, Neil, so that people can go and see your stuff. It's fantastic. Thanks. Well, and thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So anyway, let's get back to this. Um, so this week, that's what I did. I did a bunch of that. And then this wonky thing. So this is the World War I trench diorama. And uh, I put this facade on it. And it, it takes a little bit. And I'm going to show you kind of the process that I went through. But I painted it. And this is not the color. Uh, I can promise you that. Though I had some kind of neat ideas. And, and we can even talk about those. Um, I had some kind of neat ideas for the exterior. I've, I've typically well, always have done these black because I want it to disappear. What I don't want to do is, is lose some of the separation that I got here. So maybe there's something I can do. And I had some ideas about that, but I'll tell you why it's this color. Um, and we'll go all into that and, and how you can do it. If, if that's something you're interested in, because I think it's a really nice way to protect your diorama, even if it's only a single level diorama. Um, it's a nice way to cover the foam that you, that a lot of people, including myself, make dioramas out of. And it's completely separate from the diorama. The diorama can be removed. This modular system that I've adopted over the years of doing this really makes it nice that I can get in there if something should happen, if a light should go out, I can replace those lights. I can replace and, and repair the diorama if it needs because I use this facade and the, the modular system. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can certainly ask questions at any time, but yeah, we'll look at that a little bit later on and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, it looks like Neil is here. Uh, how about using dirt and rock to accentuate the depth? I, you know, I, I've talked about that a bunch and a friend of mine, John, uh, and he's not going to be here because they're on vacation and it's awesome. But John Robeck and I have talked about it. Some other people online have talked about it. Having the the different colors of the depths, because I never knew this, but in the movie Beneath Hill 60, they talk about, you know, down at a certain depth, and it's very calculatable. Calculable? It's very determinable. Anyway, at a certain depth, there are different colors of the stratus, you know, of, of the, the layers of soil. And so these different layers have, are, are due to minerals and stuff like that. So that was an idea early on is to go ahead because I have this vertical uh, mine shaft. That, that's how they access the lower levels of the, of the diorama. Because I have that, that would be a very good place to do that and show those levels and show those color changes. Um, I really like the idea. I'm terrible on execution on certain things, and I haven't really actually looked at it. I also haven't painted that, so it's not out of the eye uh, of it, but I, I think it's a, a fair idea, um, and, and, and I'd like to do it, and I've thought a lot about it, and, and, and I don't think it would be all that difficult to do. Here's the problem. There's also areas in here that would also have to be, and I don't know if I want to go and do all that, See, that's that's the real rub. So anyway, I don't know. I haven't decided. But yeah, it's it's a really cool idea to show because it is one of those things that I never knew about. And, and, and I thought it was really, really interesting. So if you haven't seen Beneath Hill 60, the movie, um, please do. Uh, it was just a fantastic movie. It's about World War I, Sappers, Anzacs. Um, and it was a lot of, uh, I, I thought, good drama. And if you like that kind of thing, I think you would really enjoy it. If you're not a war more movie person and, and, and you don't like that kind of stuff, I still think that it's quite interesting uh, because it explains a, a point in history. And 
though it's kind of like I do, you know, when, when I'm building a diorama, I've, I've got a, a moment in history in, in mind. I've got real, actual things that I'm basing on, but it's a story. It's a fabrication. It's a complete fantasy with what I'm building in my, in my diorama. There are real people and real names, Captain Livens, for example, that's in here in this diorama. And one of the main things that it's about, the Livens Large Gallery Flame Projector, it's about that, certainly, but it's not necessarily um, stone accurate. I've never, I've never heard of, honestly, and there may have been, a two-story underground uh, room in a trench. I, I honestly don't think they would do that. I don't think there was the need for it, number one. What I've seen are really cramped, really low ceiling, stuff like that. And I've gone beyond that in many places uh, right here. And I'm going to show pictures just as soon as I'm done yammering here. I'm going to show a lot of tight pictures of the inside because there's a few things that I want to talk about there. But you'll see what I mean. This is a pretty high ceiling. All the movies that I've seen, all the references I've seen, I mean, they were like trying to bump their heads and stuff. Or, or protect themselves from bumping their heads. So that's one of the reasons they would actually wear their steel pots underground. And of course, the the the, the possibility of a cave-in. But see, here I go. I, I If you ever watch this, I go on tangents. But it's going to be pretty interesting. And, and, and I think those are some of the things that we're going to cover. Because um, when you're trying to model this stuff, it's important to get enough fact so it's not just a complete... I mean, it could be like an alien thing if I just go bananas. And it could be on a different world which is perfectly fine, but I do want to couch my stuff in um, reality and then stretch that reality like you might in a movie or a, you know, a fictional novel or something. And, that, and honestly, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create scenes that are interesting within the structure of my diorama. So, and we're going to look at tight shots next. So thank you very, very much, Neil, for, for your question. Hey, is it is it bog fart or boke fart? Uh, but thank you very much for coming in and, and, and hello. I don't know if I've seen you before, but that's really cool. Martin is here. Hello, Martin. Hello, boys and girls. Cheers from Holland. Thank you very much for coming in. So we've got folks from PA. we got folks from Holland. we got folks from Australia today. It's really fun. Thanks very much for coming in, folks. So why don't we get to these pictures that I've been yammering on about? And uh, I'm going to show you what I've done lately to the diorama. So I am going to switch this over. And uh, I don't know what that is. We're going to go to this picture. See, look at that. It's like I almost know what I'm doing. So um, I like to start these things for folks maybe that haven't, you know, seen what I'm doing. I'm building a World War I trench diorama. The trench is on the top, but then I've got this, you know, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, I've got this vertical trench going or, or, or tunnel go, oh gosh, mine shaft going down. And that's how you access these lower levels. These lower levels, there's a lot of tunnels coming off of them. And it's based around um, a real thing, the Livens Large Gallery Flame Projector, which was an underground flame projector that actually was invented in 1916 by... Um, Captain William H. Livens, and then it was deployed three times in 1916, and it's a flamethrower, and it would actually shoot flame into the German lines, a devastating machine. Then the uh, unique thing about it was it was in a tunnel, so it was not above ground. It was in a tunnel, and it rose up through the turf, and and then it would it would you know shoot its stuff into the German lines. So it was a pretty unique thing and, and pretty devastating. So that's part of this. So that's what you're going to see in some of these pictures we're going to look at. So let's look at those. Um, so drawing the eye, what, what I'm talking about is when I was looking today um, and, and preparing this stuff, I, I'm always looking at how your eye kind of perceives what what I'm building, because that's what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to draw the eye into the diorama. So in here, I started looking around the diorama and I noticed that there's like three focus points or three focal points that I kind of do in a specific view. See this guy in front, he is just, he's working on a pump, but a little further back, you see the white. Now the white 
on on the entrance to a tunnel, there's two reasons for it. Number one, there's going to be a sign there, and we're going to talk about that later. You know, getting a sign that has a name on it because there was a lot of you know names for the tunnel. So I don't know if I'll put a little. I think I'll put a little board sign above it. But the other reason for the white is you're going into a lower area. You don't want to bonk your head. It's just a simple. Just you you do that when you have that kind of tunnel. So it's just a little bit of white paint, but that draws the eye. And then the last thing that draws the eye, and it's all the way down that little tunnel, that's what's actually happening. So what we have here is, is like a three like points of interest in this one little view. And what it does is it allows you to kind of draw the eye. So here's like at the beginning of the tunnel, or not the tunnel, but where they're digging the tunnel face. And you see the guy pulling the cart here, and the guy in the blue. And then the next picture is the guy loading the cart about halfway down. Uh, and then at the at the end of the tunnel face, you see the guys that are actually digging. Um, and, and that's consistent throughout the diorama. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put things in there. Now, I'd like to say that this was totally planned, and, and it partially was. I talk about that a lot. When you're doing your diorama, to try to get somebody to look deep into a place, you know, give them something to look at, right? Give them something that's going to draw the eye in. It can be a color. It can be a shape. It can be a, a figure. It can be a lighted element, you know, a lit element, whatever. It's, it's something back in there, but you don't, you don't necessarily because the angle or whatever they're coming to. So as they come up to the diorama and you've got this little room back in there, if they're not exactly at that angle, they can't see all the way back into it. So you got to give them something, a little bit of bait, a little bit of something to grab a hold of at the beginning to, to then get them to look down and then look further in. Okay. So again, I, I'm not trying to say that I'm on like all this smart and figure this out. It's just that that seems to be what happened as I was trying to draw people in, I just noticed this thing that there are these in threes, these little steps to, to just about every scene that I've kind of created. So, and I thought it was neat. So I wanted to tell you about it. Makes me look a little bit smarter maybe, but again, complete accident. Um, so let's go back and look at some more pictures. So now this is where they're working on the, um, uh, on the Livens large gallery flame projector in the lower portion of it. There, now you're looking at the middle guy that's trying to build something, and then all the way in the back, then you see that guy, you know, the officer, and he's yelling at something, who knows, you know, officers. Um, uh, no harshness on any officers out there. And then there's this room, you know, we've got the, the Anzacs, this is their common room, and you've got people, uh, you know, all the way on the outside, the younger guy with the shovel there. Then you've got the guys that are you know, in playing the, the, the card game, you know, and cheating and fun stuff there. And then all the way back, sorry, I should look back all the way back. You got stuff on the wall again, trying to draw you into the diorama. And I think one of the things that, that that's really cool about this thing, sorry, I had to get some water there is that once, once somebody notices this, when they're looking at your diorama, um, it kind of trains them to say, hey, uh, you know, as I look around, I'm going to see if any other rooms do that kind of thing. So they only really have to have it once. Now I'm doing it. I'm trying to do it as much as I possibly can to get it, you know, looking like that from all angles. But once somebody does that, and once somebody sees your diorama and then they see there's other stuff to look at, they're going to follow that same pattern. They're going to kind of look further in there. So I'm not trying to get all psychological or nothing because I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. I'm just saying I'm trying to get people to look all the way in here because I did all that work and, and I think it's cool looking and I want them, I want them to see it. You know, I mean, that's it. That that's the only thing, but it, it's kind of cool that, you know, it came out the way it did. So let's go back some more pictures. Um, this is Captain Livin's lab and in Captain Livin's lab, this is what I was referencing earlier. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine they would have a two-story lab underground during the war, under the lines. And that's the other thing that's complete fantasy. This was developed. This was a real thing. I do not believe there was any development under the lines. I believe they were built offline, you know, back and then and then maybe maybe in an, a rear area in, in, in France, somebody that somewhere that's that's possible. But I believe it was all developed in England. 
and then transported and then installed for the three that were installed and, and actually worked and deployed. And then one in the special that I saw, uh, it was on timeline uh, online uh, and just type in Livin's large gallery flame projector. You'll, you'll find it. But um, that one that they found, they went to an archeological dig and they dug it up and they found one that, and found fittings of this thing that they had pictures and drawings of that I also referenced. Um, they found that thing where uh, an artillery shell had come in and kind of hit near it. And so it collapsed the tunnel so it couldn't deploy. So, yeah. Anyway, very cool. Um, I have had some comments and I'm very sorry I haven't gotten back to you, but let's do some comments real quick and we can get back to those pictures in a second because I like to um, get back to everybody. So there's Martin. Uh, hey, Gerald, thanks very much for coming in. Hello, no speak English, French. Uh, um, I wish I knew French better, but thank you very much for coming in. And, and, and I hope some of the imagery is good and, and maybe you um, can understand me. I, I speak a very kind of low form of English. So, um, but thank you very much for coming in. Um, uh, Paul, Bill, I am from UK and living in the UK. Very cool. Thanks very much, Paul. And, and you're here like, I, I maybe maybe you've missed one of these. Goodness, you, you're always here and it's wonderful. And thank you very much for coming in. So it's great to see you today. And Mike says, uh, wife says, oh, that's cool. Very cool. My wife likes these too. And it's funny because when, when I'm talking about this stuff to my wife, you know, she doesn't maybe get into it the way I do, but she does get into these little, um, they're a little Japanese toy called Sumiko Garachi. And she gets into those and they're super tiny. So now when we're out somewhere or we're even in the yard or something like that, my wife will go, hey, look at that. That looks like a little whatever. So she is seeing things in scale and she's helping me like find stuff. So it's, it's pretty awesome. So I love it when your wife, or your partner, your husband, whomever, you know, you have it's really cool when they kind of get into it and, and maybe they're not into model building or maybe they're not into dioramas or whatever, but when they can like, you know, kind of enjoy some of those little moments because like you pick up a straw and it's like, well, that looks like a pipe. And you know what I'm saying? That kind of stuff is really cool. Or certain ferns look like just miniature plants or bushes. And it's, they're just like a dead knockoff for a smaller version of something you've seen big. And so look at little ferns. That's a that's a great one. Anyway, let me get back to this because I always get sidetracked. But thank you so much. Um, and then Mike says, uh, wife says hello. She's got the video up on the big screen. Wow, very cool. Thanks very much. Uh, you know, I hope I, I, I anyway, I'm not going to even go there. But anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. And thanks very much for coming on. So let's look at these pictures again. And let's see what we got. This is, like I said before, the big room. This is the two-story room. And in here, I don't know if I really adhered to that uh, same formula of having a three-step depth where you're, you're looking at things, but you can kind of see it. So as we as we go around it here and we we look around inside here, I think there's enough in the in the front that catches your eye and and does that same effect. It's not as deep as some of the other stuff, and so it does draw your eye in. And I think there's enough interesting stuff in there that, you know, I, I, I sometimes talk about payoff, you know, you're looking in here and you look back in there and it's like, ah, you know, it doesn't look all that great, but I want you to look back in there and, and feel like you discovered something, right? I mean, that's part of the fun. You know, you're looking in these things and you don't really know what's in there. And, and you see something and, and you, you're like, well, look at that, you know, and, and, and if it's something you didn't expect, that's what makes it fun. So that's why I put this stuff in here. I, I want it to be kind of like a, a payoff, I, I call it, you know, if you're going to get down, maybe, you know, duck your shoulders down a little bit and look into this thing. I want you to look inside here and see something that's interesting. And I'm, I'm really trying to think about everything that I put in it. You know, this is Captain Lemon's uh, like upstairs in the in the area. And, and, and this is what he's looking at. So he's got diagrams here. And these are real diagrams, by the way, from World War One, that era and, and, and all the maps and everything. And I've, I've just, you know, found them 
uh, shrink them down, and then I can maybe put them in here. But it gives a little bit more depth. And 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 what I do is I try to just put myself in the diorama and say, if this is my task, how am I going to do it? Here's some frustration. He's got stuff on the floor, you know, because he's just like, no, that's not going to work. Because the other thing I want to do is I want to have a little anxiety in here. So here he's standing upstairs in that large room. And he looks to be kind of imploring, you know, with some documents as proof, you know, of, of a point he's trying to make. And then down here, we have the French commander and the French commander in, in, in my little storyline that I've created is the local French commander, because this is in France, of course. And so this is the local French commander from the, 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 the local militia, if you will. And, um, you know, he's got his own data, you see, kind of tucked under his arm, you know, and, 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 and he's got that kind of stoic, you know, he's got his arms crossed. He's not happy at hearing what he's seeing or, or hearing what he's hearing, I should say. So I wanted to try to little, create a little anxiety, a little conflict because I, I thought it was necessary. This is his assistant. You know, we've got the, the um, chalkboard here and he's also trying to show proof of like, look, this is the work we're doing. This is what we're trying to get accomplished. So anyway, it's just that kind of, you know, the, the, the uh, thing I'm trying to create in, in all of this is something interesting enough. So it's going to draw your eye in. It's going to look at the diorama, maybe a little bit longer. It's going to, you know, you're going to feel like you found things in there. You know, you, you're, you're going to feel like this is interesting enough that I'm, I'm, I'm glad I looked at it. You know, I guess is a, is a good way to look at the, at the whole enterprise. But I want to build something that's interesting. And so when I talk about this stuff, I'm, I'm yeah, I did it. But I'm, I'm, I'm also hoping that you're picking up on that. And that's what you want to do if, if you're looking to do something like this. You know, that's the other thing. Um, not everybody's interested in building this kind of stuff. But for me, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's many, many hours. Um, we are on week 21. So I kind of order things and I, I started talking about this, I think here last, last week, um, I order things in weeks now. It just makes it easy. And I started this on week 29 of the year. That's when I started the diorama and it's, it's week 50. So the end of week 50. And so, yeah, it's 21 weeks. I've been working on this thing. And, and the neat thing about it is I've only worked on this, this time around. In the past, I've worked on multiple projects. Something I said this time, it's only this. So with the daily shorts and all that kind of stuff, you've been able to see the entire build, the entire progress up until now. Up until now, and then of course, you know, uh, I, I hope you're liking it. Um, so I don't know. I, I think I'm just talking at this point. So let's go back to my slides because I want to show you how to modify these guys. Now the cool thing is, is I do have my camera set up, so I can show you real tight how to physically do this. But we're going to look at the pictures first because it really explains kind of how I came to this, you know, modifying them to do this. So what we are doing here, oh man, see, I should have been doing this while I was yammering. I need to get back to this. Oh, back it up. Sorry. Okay. So this is how to modify scale model figures. This is the first time I did it because because this is the third time, you know, that's the thing is this one is like three. That's means this is the third time I've done it. And, and we've looked at different things. And so I kind of want to review that a little bit because in modifying these figures, I'm going to show you just one thing. But there's a lot that you can do with these figures. And and uh, this has been a really fun journey for me to do it because I've done it throughout. So let's get back to this. Um, this is the di uh, this is my uh, Dremel that I use and it's a very small bit. It's very pointy. I can get into just about everywhere. The thing about this is, is you got to go slow. You have to have your Dremel uh, or your rotary tool. If it's not Dremel, Proxon, I may think makes a great one. Uh, I've heard, um, but you want to get it low because it can gum it up. If you have your Dremel going too fast, the bit will heat up and it will just gum up. So be careful of that. The other thing I use is these. These are miniature, um, they're miniature, uh, sorry, my the camera just turned off. I got to reset it. These are miniature uh, uh, files or gee, many Christmas chisels. And they're really cool. Sorry, I had to stand up and do my other camera. 
They're really cool. I get them from Rockler. Um, there's other solutions out there, but I really like the fact that they're super sturdy. It's very good steel. These are real tools to use, but they're so small. I use them in modeling all the time, and I used it. I think these three little guys I used with the help of just my regular uh, X-Acto knife. That's really what I use for my carving primarily on this. So, you know, just tells you it doesn't take a lot, you know, to do it. And I didn't always have to use my Dremel. There was a lot that I could use with my other stuff. Okay. So um, the other tools, there you go. Now, this little tool I like because it has this little uh, very sharp point. It looks there. It's just the reflection of the light, but it's, it's actually quite sharp. Um, and that I use a, a lot. This is a, a dental tool that's great for scribing uh, and actually scooping a little spoon scoop. So the first modification I did was this. This guy, I wanted to have a T-shirt and uh, short pants on and just shoes, right? So I wanted bare legs, I wanted shorts, and I wanted, you know, bare arms and, and no webbing and stuff like that. So I started with the legs and I just made a cut, just one single cut all the way around to define the bottom of that leg. And that's going to be very similar to what we do today. So I'll show you how to do it. Then I just started whittling the legs down to make it look like a leg. Um, there I did both of them. And then you see I've taken off the webbing. I didn't do all this kind of crazy uh, uh, sculpting or anything like that. It was, it was relatively easy. I just basically smoothed out what was there. Okay, had to get some water there, sorry. Um, the next one, here we go. And so then after painting, it looks pretty believable, you know? Um, I don't have to make it perfect because after painting, all the other stuff just kind of fades in because I still have to paint this fully. But you see his arms? Remember, those had full sleeves on them. So it's it's pretty easy to do. Uh, I'm not saying it didn't take pra practice. I'm not saying like I'm some super sculptor. This isn't the first time I've done it. It takes a little bit, of course, but just take your time. The other thing is, is I tried to do this, and I don't know if I even have an example, but you know, I've got examples of other figures and the ones that I was doing when I was doing the legs work, I had a guy in shorts. Perfect way to do it. Just look at your example and, and that'll help you. Um, don't try to take off a lot. If you are trying to use this to, yeah, because I've done this. That's why I say don't do this. Um, if you're trying to use this, and I think I can turn on my other camera now and, and maybe do a close-up shot and, and show you this. Um, so here's the close-up that I'm going to be able to do. So you're going to be able to see what I'm doing here. But if you're thinking you can come in here and just do this to carve this, please don't. I tried it and it, and it really didn't work. Um, yeah, it was really, it was tragic because the knife wants to either dig in or gouge or something like that. The best way to do it is either this, you know, the Dremel, and it's very slow speed, so it doesn't gum up your bit, and you're just taking little bits off at a time, and it works pretty darn good. Um, the other way is files. I use files constantly. It's a little slower. That's perfectly fine. You want to kind of just take it down, because remember that whole thing, I can't add any more. I can only take this stuff away, so I want to just go as, as, as slowly as I can. When I'm carving something, and we'll look at that today again, I'm trying to distance myself from it and look at its general shape. I don't, it, it, it's really easy to do this because I think as a model builder, you're, you're, you know, really in there and you're trying to get rid of stuff and you're trying to carve stuff. When you're carving it to get a general shape of the lower leg, you know, or the, the torso or whatever you're doing, come back away from it. That'll help a lot because then you can get an overall perspective of what the leg should look like. If you're always in up there, because I did this too, you know, like here's the leg, but after you've been carving it for so long that it looks like it's coming out of the thing wrong because there's a lot of plastic down there you got to remove and it's easy to, so just take my advice, go a little bit farther out every once in a while and then come back in. So let's look at some more pitches. Uh, that's not the pitches I want to see. So, um, but um. Let me get over here. 
Uh, this is the second thing that I did, and that I it's not supposed to be there. Uh, that was when I built up all the Anzac guys. And what I was able to do there, and, and what I want to demonstrate is as you're building your figures, you don't have to follow necessarily what the instructions say. And 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 this is a really good point that I learned. And I figured, at, you know, it's one of those things that you figure out and then you're saying, boy, does everybody know this or is it just me? Um, and, and a lot of people do do it and a lot of people don't do it. So I'm trying to tell everybody to do it if you want. So here's what I do. I put, I just dump everything in a pile. I, I cut them off the sprue and I do that. And then I put them the way I want and I can get some great dynamic poses that the, the original piece wasn't sculpted in. And, and, and that allows me to do stuff. Now you get gaps like this. You can fill those gaps. It's easy enough to do. But you can get a heck of a lot more use out of just a standard kit. I'm not buying, you know, any of the, the, the more expensive and, 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 and quite possibly really nicer kits. But I'm not convinced. I've, I've had wonderful kits. Now, this is another one that I'm, I'm really, uh, I thought this was kind of fun. Uh, oops, wrong. I keep on going to the wrong pictures. Um, when you're trying to do your like the angle, okay? Somebody's leaning forward or someone's leaning back. There are differences that they put in these kits. And until I looked at them all, because I had them all lined out, I didn't really notice it as much. I mean, you can really kind of notice it at certain times, but I hadn't noticed, I guess is the best way to say it. Well, looking at my picture here, gosh darn it, I keep going to the wrong picture. Looking at this picture, which is the right picture, um, the ones on the far left are leaning back. As you move to the center, the ones in the, and I've got a top down picture, you can see a lot better. The ones in the center are pretty much straight up and down, but these are all gradual. They're not all leaning the same. And then on the far right, he's leaning forward. So in our next picture, you look, here it is. So looking from top down, the, the, the upper torso can give you slight variations. These are all, um, Different kits, but they're all, I believe these are all Tamiya. Um, and I use Tamiya. I use Mini Art. I use ICM. Not that I'm opposed to anybody else. It's just the ones I had, and they're great, and I really like them. So you can see there, the one on the left, he's leaning back, and then gradually they go to straight up and down. Then they gradually, as they go to the right, they move forward. So when I'm piecing them together, this is not, okay, First talked about modifying. I'm not modifying. I'm just taking the different ones and putting them together to try to find the pose that I want. I do the same thing with the arms. I do the same thing with the legs. And by the time you're done, you can get a completely different pose. Now, I don't believe that this is something that the manufacturers don't think of because some are not like that. Some make their figures where they actually notch together. And they go in and there's no other way to do it unless you modify the part. And, and, and that's okay too. It's not hard. It's plastic. We do it all the time. But some of them, a lot of them, to me it does, they're not. So you have a basic shape for the right upper hip and a basic shape for the left upper hip. And they'll pretty much go together in, in, into, you know, even combinations that wouldn't look natural, so it doesn't work. But the fact is, they pretty much go together, which is great, and, and, and allows you to do this without much modification, and without, um, you know, making the thing just look, you know, dumb. I mean, <laughs> I, don't have a, I don't have a better word for it, because I've done that too. So anyway, if you're not doing that, um, it works great. So we did that. We talked about that. Uh, in, 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 these are all previous episodes of, you know, how to diorama, but then, uh, oh, here's another one, you know, just changing hands, you know, changing hands is really easy. Um, but it may, it becomes a, a very weak point. And so it's a good idea if you can drill into it with a very small twist drill, put a little tiny piece of brass or something like that, and then re-glue it. And, and, and then it works great. Um, and then this is what we're going to do today. This is our, our bottom end rebuild. So it's kind of like, you know, when you're rebuilding a, uh, when you're rebuilding an engine, you know, bottom end rebuild. I hope that was not a bad joke. <laughs> anyway, so what happens is this. I have the figure on the left. 
This is a World War II British figure. And you'll notice the pants. He's got a, a high pocket on the right hip. He has got a uh, left thigh large pocket. Um, and his jacket really kind of stops right below the belt line. And the, the pants are, are quite big. You know, they're balloony, right? I, I was calling them pajamas. And you need that room to move around. So I'm not saying anything, but I'm just saying they're, they're big, right? Well, if you look to the far right there, um, that is a World War I soldier. And the, the wrap around the lower part of the leg, uh, that's called putties, uh, or they are called putties. And it's a wrap uh, that wraps the lower uh, from the knee down. And then the other thing that, and, and I'm sure I've got a picture here, There, this is a World War I uh, soldier. The putties are down below the knee. And then the other big difference is you'll notice the jacket the jacket is longer. The jacket comes down below the, um, the belt line. And, and so I wanted to try to simulate that by carving. And, and so the first thing I did was the putties. That was the easiest part. And to make this line, you see the cut line uh, around right below the knee, it's just as easy to, to you know, use this knife. And, and this is a little bit modified. So this is a standard standard X-Acto knife, uh, hobby knife, if you want to call it. I cut mine a little bit short because for me, it just makes it easy to get into to small places. But I'm just taking that very easily, very slowly, um, and, and, and I'm rolling it around. I use a support. I have a, a wooden support that I can, and it's, and it's you know locked down to my desk, and it, it allows me to cut on stuff. Please don't do anything that I'm going to show you today freehand. There's, there is a, a serious danger, as we all know, in using these sharp tools in very tight quarters to their hand. So that's the first thing I do. Um, and then I just simply start shaving that away. I'm doing that with my uh, Dremel, my Moto tool. Uh, I've got one other person that came in. Go for it Painting is here. Hello, Go for it Painting. Thanks very much for coming in. Great to see you. It's been a little bit. Um, so after I have done that and kind of gotten down to the area, and, and this might be a little bit hard to see, but I'm taking the chisel. I'm taking the small chisel that I have, and I'm working my way around. Um, I need to, to bring up my other camera. See, this is, this is going to be bananas. I'm taking this and I'm cutting into underneath that cut that I've made because I need to level that out. I need to kind of get me a nice right angle on uh, where that, that top pant leg is coming in to where the putty is tucked around. So you want that to come in. Now, later on, you're going to want to, you know, clean that up and you'll see my examples of that, but that's a pretty important part. Okay. So let's see if I can get back to the right camera. Hey, look at that. I'm getting better at this. Um, so there I've got the left putty. It was the same deal. I'm going around. It's done in a spiral. It is wrapped around the leg. Um, I believe it's from the bottom up and then tied off uh, like right above the uh, the calf, right below the knee. And then I, I started on the left-hand side. Now, it doesn't look all that pretty here. So this was the first... Not the first putty I've done, but the first ones that I started doing here. So give yourself a chance to learn it. I think I can still get a little thinner on these two. So I'm giving myself, you know, a, a little bit of room. So there's two putties. So I'm pretty good so far. The next part is I had to shave off those pockets. So again, I'm using that small chisel. And, and here's where it gets a little dicey because you're kind of you know, moving that chisel very slowly toward your fingers. You figure out how it's going to be the best way for you, but you just want to shave those off. You want to keep as much of that plastic as you possibly can. So there they are. They're partially shaved off. And then I went over it with a very small file to kind of smooth it. Now that it's smooth, now I'm taking that same thing and I'm just making the outline. And this is, and I had to move this up a little bit but I'm just making the outline of what's going to become the bottom of the jacket. 
Okay, and I'm going to carve the legs up into that again, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll show you what I mean. Again, we're going to do this live a little bit later on. So as soon as we're done looking at these pictures, we're going to go live, and I'm, and I'm going to show you how to do this. Here's around the back. Now, do you see the two indentations that are in the, the back there above my line? I eventually moved it up above those, just above those, and it looks a lot better. I, I don't know what I was thinking with this first time around. So there it's been cut. And do you see what I mean by cutting into it? So I made the line and then I just slowly, very slowly with the, the little chisel I have cut up toward that line and then into the plastic. And that gave me that nice sharp bottom of his jacket. Here's the front because it was the same thing with making these pockets. So all I had to do here was to make that pocket, I just draw it very lightly. I, I, I don't have to bear down. You know, when you're working real tight there, it's real easy to think, oh, I can just get this in one shot, right? I, I thought that, that's why I'm saying that. I'm like, wait a minute, if this thing shifts, if this thing moves, you know, right into my finger. So super careful here. Um, so little tiny, little bits at a time. And it still doesn't take long, right? So please be very careful here. So um, after cutting those in, I just went back over it a few times with the file. And, and this is where it stands right now. So looking at those putties, I think that I've got a pretty good representation of a putty. I think that, I, I hope you can tell, I took the bottom of the pants where they tuck into the putties. And I did round that. That's important. If it comes off like the, the jacket above, I don't think it looks good. I think it needs to round off because they're tucked in. Um, the other thing is, is I think the thighs on this are a little bit thick. I think I need to, to, to bring the thighs in a little bit. And I think that's going to finish this figure up. So next, we're going to do this live. And um, I, I mean, look, I'm going to do the whole thing. So could take some time. I hope that's not uh, a big issue. The camera that I'm doing it on, I don't know why it like turns off after 20 seconds or, or 20 minutes. Sorry. So I'm going to have to like maybe stop if you lose uh, the picture, but it's just, I got to turn it on. And it takes a couple of seconds. So we'll work through that, but now we're just going to show you how I did it. I don't know what the sound's going to do because I'm going to use me, my uh, Dremel and it's going to make a little bit of noise, but it, it shouldn't be a big deal. So let's do this. Uh, I got my camera on and we will switch to that camera. All right. And so remember, oh, that's my new figure. Here's the other thing I came up with. And this is probably not um, like really uh, a smart one. Don't put the arms on yet. I had the arms on the other figure before I started this project, and uh, and that made it really difficult. So do it before you put the arms on, and it goes a heck of a lot better. So uh, the first thing I did, and I'm going to do this just like I did it. I'm going to turn this over. This is just like my working block. It's it's my riser, and it allows me to rise this up and 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 uh, you know get a little work on it. I'm using my chisel. You can use the your other thing. I'm identifying the knee. The knee is right there. You can kind of see it. it's very light in there. And I'm just doing this. Okay. I'm just rocking it back and forth. I'm not going heavy. I'm not going too hard. I don't want to cut my fingers. Um, and then you have to kind of, you know, each time I'm doing this, I'm trying to find a stable place is I'm sorry. Uh, I want to make sure I'm focused folks. I'm, I'm concentrating on what I'm doing and not if you can see what I'm doing. I'm very sorry about that. Here we go. So let's get there. Focus, focus. So I'm just rocking it around there and getting that in there. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to lock my focus so it's not auto focusing, and then I think that'll be better. So let me do that real quick. I'm very sorry about that. Okay. Okay, folks. Now it's on me to keep in the in the right spot, but I think that'll be better. So I've got this like marked, okay? And the only reason I marked it is because when I come in here, I just wanna know where I'm going to. 
These little deals on the bottom of here, these are like little straps for the, the new stuff. I don't know what they're called. They're from the World War II uniform. They're not necessary, so I'm going to go over that. So I'm going to clear all this out, and I'm just going to taper it down and, and try to get that so that I've got it smoothed out in the shape of a leg. I hope that is not an annoying sound. And one of the things that happens here, of course, is I'm going to get a bunch of this stuff coming up, all the fuzzy stuff. But I'll show you what I do there. It's, I mean, it's not a big deal. It's just I use um, either a brass or a steel brush. And the brass and steel brushes will um, take that stuff away pretty easily. But they can also take plastic away, so you've got to be careful. So now here, I've got all pretty much on one side here. I've got all of the, I've got all the pants off. So what I'm going to do is just take my brass brush and just like that. And that really helps. I'm going to dump this. That really helps to see where I'm at. Now I haven't done the other side of the leg and I think for time purposes, I'm not going to, uh, but I'm going to continue here and you'll get a good idea what I need to do. So now the shaping, I know I've got a calf back there, and I'm literally doing a rough outline of the calf. I want it to kind of come in a little bit. But remember, this is a wrap around the calf. I don't want it, you know, I'm not trying to get this down to a bare leg. I just want the shape. Okay, and I think I have it there. So I can turn that off for now. And I go back to my brass brush. And again, this brass, this brass brush is great. It'll take that stuff off there. But it will also take off some of your detail. So don't go to town on that thing because it really will. So now this is where we come in. And I'm going to cut toward my fingers. Sometimes what I'll do, and I'll, I'll come out here. This is um, grip tape. This is something that you can get at like a woodworking store or just order online, something like that. But it, um, I think like gymnasts use it and stuff like that. Also like around their ankles and, and wrists and things like that. Um, Cause it, it'll help there too, but it'll grip to itself and it, it and it's not going to save you from cutting yourself. It is not that, but what it will do is it will make sure that you don't slip. Cause typically where I find um, I've cut myself and I've cut myself a lot, not just in, in model making, but, uh, a woodworker for 30 years. So yeah, lots of cuts. Um, but all I'm going to do is, is just take this. I just cut a little piece off and just go around a couple of times. That's all you need. You don't need a bunch of this stuff because again, it's not protection. It's grip. I just want to make sure I'm not going to slip again. Every time, every single time I've ever cut myself, it's because I slipped. Okay, so we're gonna go back into here. And I'm holding it, and I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna make sure you can see what I'm doing, because there is a line right there, and I'm gonna cut into it. And I'm gonna I'm gonna cut into it very, very easily and very shallow, and then I'm gonna redefine the line. And, and this is for folks that haven't done this. If you've done this, you know, you know how to do this. Great. Um, but if for folks that haven't done it, this is how you kind of come in and redefine the line. The thing that's nice about this chisel is I've got a flat side so I can keep it, you know, real flat, something like that. But I've also got a bevel there. And it allows me to get, because right here, because of the toe, I can't use that other side. I can come in here. Same thing. And all I'm doing is I'm defining where that pant leg is going to come in to where that's cut, okay? Because that's defining the top of the putty, OK? 
Okay, it goes a little faster when you get a little thing, but 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 keep be careful. You don't want to get faster than what you think you should be doing, because uh, that's when you'll make a mistake or cut yourself. Um, there are also sometimes air pockets or voids in sprue. Uh, I've I've run across it on older models, maybe not so much now, but. If you find an older figure you like and it's like, hey, I want that guy, and you start working on it. Well, if you're if you're coming toward yourself like this, like I'm doing here, and you hit an air pocket, you've got less resistance pushing on your tool, and it'll it'll jump on you. So just take it slow. I, I'm probably overemphasizing this, but I I really want to make sure I'm getting my point across, and uh, and you're safe doing this because um, it is it is actually dangerous. Okay, so now. It did not take an awful lot to get that down to kind of the rough shape. I could probably take a little bit more off the, the, the back of the leg there, but that's my rough shape. So now on the putty looking real tight uh, down here, there is a wrap that goes all the way around the top here, and then it starts spiraling. So um, first, I need to clean it up a little bit. So I'm using some very small files. Um, uh, this is a square file. And so I'm just kind of coming in here. I'm putting it right up against that. And I'm just trying to get rid of any ridges that were created from me carving. Because there's, there's a little bit there. This one's really hard to get to. The other thing um, that I use this for is scraping quite a bit. So I can come in here and I can scrape and get rid of those ridges. And that works pretty darn good, too. You know, uh, when I started woodworking years ago, one of the things that I adopted was there's a right tool for everything. But it doesn't mean that's the only thing that tool does. So um, I like to understand what this tool does, you know, what it's meant for. But just like scraping, you can do another tool that way, too. OK, so that's done. Now I'm going to go right back to this. Now I've got this is the third one. This is the largest one. And that just I like that one for cutting. Uh, around. Uh, I'm going to go right to the edge again, make sure you're in focus. And setting it on the edge here, I'm just going to go, and this is about a 32nd of an inch, and I'm just rocking it over. I'm not pushing. You can go right through this plastic. Please don't do that because uh, it'll get to your finger. Um, so I'm just walking it around. The other thing that I'm doing here is I'm just kind of, you know, making sure my line is in the right spot. If it's not in a, I go too far, then I'm stuck with it. So just a, def a defining line. Let's make sure I'm still in focus here. There we go. Next, after I got my defining line, I'm going to come off just at an angle like so. And what I observed, uh, at least on these, is they're spiraling um, from the top down around. Uh, sorry. Uh, they're coming in from the inside and they're going around the leg this direction on either leg. So they both spiral outwards. So from the inside to the outside down, that's the direction they go on the leg. Okay, let's get back to it. And so that's the kind of spiral I'm trying to make. And all I'm doing, I don't have to like, you know, make a spiral all the way around. All I do is I make it at the angle that I want so that where I, where I end is the thickness of uh, that I want. Are you getting that? That's the end. And then the beginning of it, I angle it towards the start. So the intersect. So I'm just, I'm, here's the, I'm sorry. <laughs> here's the line that I'm starting on, right? And so I put the bottom of the chisel at the distance I want away from it. And then that right next to it. And then I make a little impression. That's all I have to do on this side. And I'll show you what I do next. <clears throat> I could have done a, a visual like I did before. Now I can just make a mark, just the same angle, make sure you got the same angle, all the way down the leg, just like that. I'm not going all the way around the leg. I'm just getting my distance, right? And then as I turn the leg, I can pick up that. And as long as I keep the same angle, I just do that. And if you're careful, what will happen is you will actually match up. That takes a little practice, okay, to do, but it works. Now, I'm only going to do one side because I didn't carve the other side, but that's how you do it. And they do match up, okay? So just be careful that way. 
think about, you know, go slow, but you start with that angle is the first what. And once you've got that angle set, you do the same distance you want at the tail end of it. Just do it at angle, that same angle, that same distance, same angle, same distance, same angle, same distance. And it works great. Okay. Now that they're cut, let's go back and look at it. Now that they're cut, I've got little lines in there. You can just about see them. See those lines? Now you can. Now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to come back in here and I'm just going to do little indentations from the bottom. These overlap from the top to the bottom. So I'm just going to go in there and cut up. And I, I am like, when I'm looking at the line that I've cut in there, it's very, it's just a very small line. Well, I'm probably doing that distance away from the line, cutting into it. In other words, I'm doubling the distance away from the line for where I start my cut. So if this is where I'm cutting and this is the width of my line, I'm just going right next to it, the, the width of the line, and then I cut toward it. That's probably the most terrible example I could probably make. I hope that visually it came across because I just want to do a little notch underneath it, right? So here's the flat surface and I got a little notch right there. I just want to do just like that. And what that does is I'm creating a little gap below that line and that creates shadow because that's what we're trying to do here, right? So you're just trying to create a little bit of a shadow below that line. So a little notch below it does it. And that's all you got to do. You don't have to do a whole bunch. Okay, so let's go back and look at it. Uh, this is where I like to bring in this little guy. This is the uh, dental hook. So now that I've cut these, I can just kind of go in here and just clean them out. Um, I might have to go back to the See, that one's working. The other one didn't want to work because I might just have to cut better. But look at that. They just come right out. And what I have left is there's, uh, let me get my brush in here. What I have left now is just the marking that will basically pick up enough shadow. I'm trying to get the shadow on it to look like a putty. See that? How's that look? Now, the other thing that we got to do, and this is a round file, it's a really, really small round file. Uh, I told you about that late, uh, before, is I want to make sure that I blend the pant into the top of the putty because it looks a little wonky if it's, if it's just kind of this straight edge. So I'm just rounding that off. The other thing you're going to see is there are lines in the pant. See this? These are like folds and things like that. Well, you just want to take that fold and just follow it to its terminus. So it looks like it's it's in there, but then take the end of it and round over the end. And, and it's probably hard as heck to see on what I'm doing, but it really does work well. And, and that's what I did here. So on this one, it looks a lot better. See the bottoms of those, how they're rounded into the tucked in part of the putty? That's what I'm talking about. And I followed the the tucks and stuff of the original pant sculpt okay so anyway that's uh the lower part of the leg so the next part is the upper part and i just want to get make sure i'm focused here the next part is this i've got this big pocket here on the left and then this pocket here now i, I can take them off with this but last night uh when i was doing it i just did it with these and i think it worked fine again Please be super careful. I'm going right at my fingers here, but I don't start at the bottom of this. I just start at the top of this and I'm just taking off the little fold over there. And, and the other thing that I think I, I'm sorry, I don't think you can see what the heck I'm doing. Um, the other thing that I noticed was that though there's a lot of shadow and, and it looks like something's, uh, you know, really uh big or deep or something it's not so when you're taking this off it's a lot thinner than it looks uh from first glance and you see i'm just shaving it i'm really taking my time i'm not trying to gouge it i'm going just as as slow as i possibly can because i don't want to take too much off and i don't want to cut myself okay so that pocket now is effectively gone. I don't have to get it completely gone. I'm, I just, I need to get it so that when I, I do a little sanding on this, it'll disappear. Okay, there we go. 
And I'm only going to do this side. I'm not going to do, well, I guess I have to do the other side because I did that on the other side. So I got to do this one. It would look really weird. I was just going to do one side, but I shaved the wrong pocket. So, all right. So again, not a lot. Now, what I need to determine at this point is where is the jacket? You know, how far down does the jacket go? Well, you know, just go back to your example. Here's the example that I'm using. See, it only, it, it, it basically comes right down to where the legs are, are joining right there in the, right there, the inseam. Ha, huh, boy, I was trying to think of something that wasn't, you know, sounding bad. Inseam, thank you very much. Um, So right there at the inseam. But here's something that's really important. I discovered this last night. When you're doing them, and, and you'll see it on this one, they're not exactly aligned. Let me get this backed up. You see that? They're not exactly aligned. And that's very helpful when, when you're carving yours. Um, I did that same thing last night, you know, because I just do one line all the way around it to start the bottom of the jacket. But when I came to that center point, initially they just lined up. It looked weird. If one's just a little bit shorter, one's a little bit deeper, one's a little bit further out, that works good. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to do one side, but you'll see what I'm saying. So. We now I'm going to go back to my um, chisel and I'll, I'll tell you what, if you don't have a chisel, you probably got one of these. So let's do it with that, because I want you to know that you can do it with either. I'm just doing with with the, the, the tool I like. I'm trying to get this in the focus point. Sorry. So now I'm, I'm, I'm holding him. I'm going to hold him this way, I'm holding him a little bit higher. And right there is where I'm going to start my cut. And and just like before, I'm just rolling kind of just, you know, I'm not really trying to get a heck of a lot in there. I know that I'm going to need enough for a pocket because there's a pocket on either side. And here's where I got messed up last night when I was doing it. I kind of followed like this and got too low, but don't. It, it should come straight back. I think Oscar just woke up from his nap. That's the noise you hear in the background. <laughs> um, hey, buddy. How are you doing? You went down? I'm sorry, folks. Oscar just woke up and he needs to get down. He's uh, he's always up on the uh, bench with me. Okay. So back to this. You are very patient and thank you very much. Um, so we're just cutting along there. And, and as I'm doing it, I'm trying to make sure, you know, I'm looking to make sure I'm going to line everything up. I, I, I want it to look, you know, everything to line up. I'm going to cut a lot off the bottom, but I'm not going to cut a lot off the top. I will have to trim some of the stuff above this line, but only really to kind of smooth it out. I want to preserve as much up there as possible. So now I'm going to do the same thing that I did. I'm going to turn it over here. Same thing that I did at the bottom uh, below the knee. And I'm going to take my chisel. You can't, well, yeah, see, there you go. I should do it with this. You can use this. And, and I'm just going to slowly go into it. Um, a lot of times, and, and if you've used a hobby knife a few times, um, because you use it so much, the, um, the tip, the heel of your knife is the one that uh, is the sharpest. So a lot of times that's what I'll do is I'll just come back here to the heel for something like this. You know, I, I'm telling you, you got to get a set of these. They're about 30 some odd dollars. Uh, and it's not a bad investment because I'm telling you, they're so much better for doing this kind of work at least. And I use them for all kinds of stuff, but I really like doing them for this. So there's that. Now, um, I did the wrong side again, but I think it's come along. Now, remember, as I'm, I'm doing these cuts up from the bottom, I will need to come in and redefine this. I'm going to redefine this. If, if what you're cutting upward toward doesn't separate, that's all you have to do. Don't try to flick it up. It's possible, depending on the, the kind of uh, uh, plastic you're using, if it's brittle, it could break or, or damage another portion of it. And, and I don't want that to happen to you. So I'm just going to do this. Can you see? I want to make sure that I'm, I'm getting this on here. Um, there we go. I think you can see that. 
I just need to get this stuff knocked down enough to see the bottom of the jacket. And, and it needs to be, you know, it's a separate article of clothing. Think about it like that, too. It's not just something that, you know, you're trying to get a little bit of definition out of, like the pocket. That's that's what we're doing after this. Um, so once I got those, I can maybe get those off. But here you redefine the bottom, and I think we're going to have our jacket bottom done. Again, I'm not really pressing hard, just enough. And we'll come back and work on the leg because like my other one, I think it needs some work on the leg. But for now, that is our jacket bottom for the left side or his right side, sorry. Okay, so. There is the bottom of the jacket. Let me get a better. Why am I all of a sudden blowing out? Okay, can you see that? So we've got our bottom of our jacket there. That's better. And I'm going to have to come back to this, this leg and, and do a little clean up there and, and, you know, get those folds in. But I think it looks good. Now, a couple of things left. I've been talking about the pockets. Yep, they're going to have to go there. But the other thing is going to be the split, the jacket split. Now, the jacket split, you need to really make sure because it's possible that you twisted the top like I've done here. You've twisted the top of the figure a little bit so that the, the uh, top of the shirt doesn't align with the fly that's down here. So don't just use the fly as what you're going to have for the split and the tails of the jacket. Do it from this or it won't look right. you got to do it from the shirt above because it's the same article of clothing. So... I'm going to come in here and I'm going to look where that is. It's a little bit off from the fly and I'm going to just make one cut right there. Okay. Then I'm going to come over here and just, you know, a little bit of an angle because I want to kind of come up and then come together. Sorry. Uh, I want to come up and come together. So just a little bit of an angle. Um, I'm going to cut down here and just like that. That's all I need to start this. I'm just trying to define you know, the parameters of where I'm going to be working because there is a lot of work here in the inseam because I got to bring this stuff in, you know, kind of like this and, and stuff like that. Show you exactly what I mean. Just like that. Got to be really careful here because uh, your fingers. And there you go. And that looks a little bit better. So that is the split in the front and now that i have that there now i can kind of judge where i want my pockets and that's why i wanted to do the split before i did the pocket and i'm going to try to angle this so you can see better you can see that split so now the pocket let's look at those uh some are less pronounced this one has good pockets maybe not man where'd my pocket guy go um -da -da -da. i got a guy with great pockets and that's what we are looking for. Uh, I think this guy has got great pockets. Well, he's an Australian guy. Anyway, there are pockets now because I can't find anything. But all I want to do is I want to, number one, make sure that I'm going to be even on either side of that split. Again, that's why I put that there. So I'm going to come over here probably about a 32nd of an inch. And it, it goes from there. Okay, your pocket, and I'm just going to do a little bit of line, not a heavy line. It's just almost like a scribe, right? There. And then I'm going to come all the way around to the side. Now, this is important. See that right there? That was the pocket on the side of the trousers for him. So that pocket right there is where the, the pocket is going to end. When I looked on the other ones, you know, the better examples that I can't find right now. Um, when I looked on them, that's where the pocket ends. And the pocket has a, a uh, you know, a flap over the top that is straight on top, but the bottom has the two little dimples in it, and there's a little button in the middle. So that's the other thing. So we're going to first define the pocket. Then we're going to go ahead and define the, the two little dimples there, and then we just carve it back. Okay? So here we go.
You guys are awesome, basically, for staying on this long, by the way. This has been an awfully long diorama, uh, how-to diorama, but I really appreciate it. Um, okay, so I come all the way. I'm just getting rid of some stuff in my way. So I'm going to go from there to the pocket and then probably equal distance from the middle to the bottom. I'm just going to rock. That is now the bottom of the pocket, right like that. So I'm doing the same process. Now this is, you know, you get pretty practice at it because it's just, it's basically the same thing on every one of these that we've done. Sorry, I'm trying to get this back in focus for you. I'm just coming up to those little scribe lines. I have got to go very, very small cuts because I have not got a lot of depth on that cut. I don't want a lot of depth on that cut. All I'm trying to do is get a shadow line. That's really all that I want. By creating a shadow line, you're seeing a pocket. Okay, so I did that now on the bottom. I'm going to come to the side, and it's the exact same thing. Here, I've got a different chisel. This is my smallest one, and it's really nice to come in here, and I'm just defining that line. There's that scribe line I made. I'm just helping to define it, and I'm cutting away just to the right of that line as I see it. I, I'm not going to worry about, now here's something that I worried about last night and it was just silly. Here's the pocket. Here's the top of the pocket. I've got this, you know, flap that comes and comes over the pocket. It looks like it kind of extends out the side. Don't worry about it. All you have to do is when we do that thing, it'll naturally work that way some way. I'll show you how it works, but it looks very natural. So that's what I'm carving now is I've got both sides of the pocket because the, the pocket here looks like the top pocket's edge. So I don't have to do anything there. I only have to define this and the bottom. Now I'm gonna start doing the um, uh, the flap over the pocket. This is where I use my little pointy tool, okay? And the little pointy tool, I'm gonna go real careful. I'm gonna find the center of the pocket and kind of make a, a, a lazy M. And I'm just going real slow, real light just like everything else. See that is kind of like a half an M. Flip it over, come from the center and do the same thing. Right there is the center. And I'm gonna come up and do kind of like a lazy M right there. Now, right, now this one actually works pretty good this way. Um, here, because this is so small, this area is so small, I can just kind of scrape below those lines that I made. And I'm removing enough material underneath it to get the shadow line I'm looking for. You know, the, the important thing about the top of this, uh, his pants, aka the, the, the bottom of his jacket is there's, there's, enough material there if you're careful with it you know okay so that's one side see if i can get the i'm going to try this this might be a little bit faster actually that one worked but i think this might be faster and i can get a little deeper doing my little up cuts then come back here i'm holding the knife upside down sometimes that's a better scraper okay that looks good i'm gonna get the side a little bit more Okay, look at that. So now, um, there we go. So that, if you look at his, this is his right leg. So we did putties. It needs a lot of work, obviously. But we did putties on the right leg. And then we carved the top of his pants to look like a jacket. And I'm telling you, once I take that, that leg and sculpt a little bit better, you can't tell it wasn't that. Because see the uniform, it seems to fall just properly that way. Let's back it up a little bit, sorry. Is that working? There we go. See, the, the, the jacket looks like it's pretty natural. Oh man, see, that's what I was talking about. That was totally 20 minutes, so that's funny. Um, but there you go, we did the whole thing. It needs refinement. 
you know, we need to get in there and, and, and kind of smooth stuff. And, and those folds in the fabric are fantastic. You know, you just extend those. You can create your own. The thing that I really like to use for that is my little fine. It's like a jeweler's fine round file. Um, that makes fantastic little folds in clothing. And you just gently go in there and follow a line and then you get a fold in your clothing. Um, but I love that. I mean, that, that allowed me this, this ability to modify my figures just by, you know, how they're posed or, or actually changing the type of clothing that they had, um, has really made a big difference because I'm not kind of locked in to what people have. I'm buying the same kits that I've bought before, not because I want that figure in that pose, but because I know I can do other stuff with that figure, with these techniques. So I hope that's interesting. Let's, I've been yammering along again forever. So let's look at a couple of comments if you do not mind. And uh, we'll take a look. Okay. Uh, so I think the last one, hey, Link is here. Oh, I will make sure I get all these. The chisel seems really sharp. How do you maintain that? Uh, Templar. Wow, we got a lot of folks. I'm sorry. Um, there we go. So Neil, thanks very much. And, and he would know because Neil does one sixth and he's done extensive, you know, research and stuff like that on the World War One uh, folks. And he says, so it does start at the ankle and wraps up. So that's exactly right. And that's why when I'm doing the cuts, for the putties, you know, we do that spiral around the leg. We want to cut upwards to that spiral. So that leaves then the higher part above and then a, a little bit of an indent for below that shows an overlap and it leaves you the shadow line to define the putty. So yeah, perfect. There you go. Thanks very much, Neil. I appreciate it. Uh, Templar uh, 1119. Hello. I, I don't think that uh, we've spoken, but maybe I know. Um, hey, man, how's it going? Can you explain in Indian for me as well? English, not good. I'm very sorry, Templar. I don't know Indian, but uh, or or the dialect, but um, maybe there, you know, when when this is published, it will have subtitles and maybe it can be in Tem it, it, maybe it can be in um, in Indian. That would be kind of cool. I don't know. So very sorry, but I hope you're enjoying maybe watching some of it, but thanks very much for commenting too. Uh, Martin says, your chisel seems really sharp. How do you maintain that? Really good point. Um, I've got a couple of different ways of doing it. Now, I like to have something at the bench. And so at the bench, I've got this and it's, um, it's a little um, stone and it's, I don't know the grit, I'm very sorry to say, but it's quite, it's fine, but you can still feel the grit. I would say maybe 1200. And it's a, it looks like an oil stone. Had it for a long time. Um, and so I can use that to just come up here. And I don't know if you've ever sharpened a chisel like that, but what you do is you want to find two things. You want to find the flat on your chisel. Hey, I can do it here. Wait, I need to go turn this camera back on. And then I can show you real tight, Martin, how we do this. Because some folks haven't done it. You know, I, I take for granted that we learned to sharpen stuff, you know, growing up. But some folks just haven't done that. And, you know, it'd be a good lesson. So <clears throat> this, what I want to do is I want to do on a chisel, there are two things that I have to really be uh, aware of. Number one, the back, uh, how flat the back of the chisel is right here. I'm not focused, am I? Sorry. So the back has to be super flat and then the bevel needs to be super flat. So those two angles coming together make your cutting surface. So what you want to do, <clears throat> pardon me, on your back is you want to just lay it down very carefully on your, on your sharpening stone, push straight down on it and just move it forward just a couple of times. You don't have to do a lot. Uh, if you're chewing it up for the first time, then, then maybe more. Okay. But you're just trying to make sure there's no burrs. There's nothing on there. The second thing you do, is you, you come in, this is for the bevel, is I, I put the heel, that's the heel of the bevel right there. You put the heel on the stone and then you bring it up until you feel it level. You'll feel it and then it'll kind of rock there. Once you've got that, you hold that angle and you go very carefully forward. Now I'm, I'm not putting any pressure, I'm just holding that angle. And over time you'll learn how to do that. Now. The last thing you can do to keep that sharp 
is to use a strop or a strop. Is it a strop? I think it's a strop, um, which is leather with a bit of rosin on it. Now, I don't have one here, but you can buy them and it comes on a little card and it, and it really actually works quite good. And it that leather with that um, uh, honing compound on it, you can just draw that right across there and something that you think is dull, sharpen right up. I've got a professional um, knife sharpening machine over there. It's called a Tormac T7. And um, I, I have that from my woodworking. And so I can just take any of my tools and just poof, right over there. Works great. Um, but they're about a thousand bucks. So yeah, you, this is much cheaper and, and, and works fantastic. Um, and keeps them super, super sharp. And the sharper they are, the safer they are because you don't have to push as hard to cut. So thanks very much for that, Martin. Link, hello. It's very nice to see you, Link. I haven't seen you for a while, so that's great. And I love it when you chime in. That's really awesome. Uh, hope you're having a great day. Uh, Neil says, the putties look good, Bill. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You know, one of the things that I did um, on the one that I finished, and, and like I say, you know, you have to do a little bit of cleanup and stuff like that. When I did the putties on the first one, I cut into the surface. You know, you do this straight line on top, and then you do the little cut into the bottom to create that little shadow. I did that a little bit too much. Well, it worked out great because I was able to use my file, and, I, and, and, and by filing over that, like the length of the leg, you know, the spiral is going this way, but I'm filing it over this way. I was able to reduce the size of the leg a little bit, and... It, it, it reduced my cuts because I'm renew, removing that material and it kind of leveled out. So if you do think you've cut too deep, just try sanding it back a little bit, filing it back a little bit, and you'll get a, a, a less of a cut. So just remove some of that other material and it'll help. Uh, and that worked for me. Um, thanks very much, Neil. That's awesome. Is that a vera, Veritas chisel bill? Yes, it is. And uh, Veritas, ver, Veritas, Veritas, I... Yeah, me in English, remember, remedial. Um, and I'm English, I'm, I'm a, yeah, anyway. So these are fantastic. It's a set. They are from Lee Valley Veritas, and it's a Canadian company. Um, and I've been buying their tools for 20, no, 30 plus years. And they're fantastic. I really love their tools. Very high quality tools. They um, just really nice. I, I, I like their stuff. Uh, I've got a lot of the books. I, I can't tell you how much I have gotten from them over the years because it's just, I can't, can't calculate it. Really great company. I highly recommend Lee Valley. Um, and these are part of a set where each year for the past 17 or 18 years, they come out with a miniature set of tools around Christmas time. Um, and my, uh, my wife, Mrs. Modelcraft, uh, right when it started, she got me the very first one and every year thereafter. And that's what I have for my, uh, miniature tool bench, which is a fully working tool bench in small scale. These are third scale, but my bench is not really third scale. Um, but yeah, I love these tools. They're fantastic and they are meant to take an edge. They're not junk. They're not just like a toy or something like that. They're real tools and I use them all the time. Uh, wonderful for model building. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, and then Neil says, Bill, watch out. Your diorama just got hit by a chair when you turned around for Oscar. I know it just, man, I did that earlier too. And I didn't have the, the, uh, cover on it. Um, my wife was in here and I turn around, you know, and oh yeah, it's pretty tough. I will say, but I don't want to, I don't want to mess it up. So thanks very much, Neil. Very cool. Okay, folks. Wow. That, it seems hard to say, but we're not even done. I hope you can stick around because we do have some pictures from Mike. Uh, he sent some pictures in, but we're going to talk a little bit more about, I don't even know what's coming up, but stuff. So let's go back to this and where and what is next i don't even know oh this is another guy that i built this week and and i thought it was really fun um because he needed i needed some guys in the lift room and the lift room is above the vertical shaft it's it's right here this is the lift room and i wanted something i i like to put something fun in the diorama 
And so this guy's holding a stick. And then I built this little set of crates here for him um, to lean against. And he's going to be dangling a sign down in front of the Anzacs, um, you know, their, their tunnel entrance. So I just thought it was kind of fun. And so I wanted to throw that in. Uh, so next, uh, facade work and tunnel names. So I want to talk about tunnel names and I want to talk about facade work. Um, this is the facade that I built. And I think I've, I've discussed it well enough, but, you know, it protects the diorama. It's made out of MDF. Um, it's got a, a, a bunch of stuff inside structurally to, to hold it together and, and it's meant to protect it. And so I, I built it and here you can see some of those corner structures that, that, that help it, uh, you know, stay together. Those then have to correspondingly be cut into the diorama because, you know, they kind of have to fit into it. Works out great, no problem. Um, but then it kind of locks it in. It, it also still allows it to come out. I had it out earlier today. Um, it can all come out and come apart. So I really like my design. I put a, a bottom on it uh, this week. And then I sanded the whole thing to include the edges. And then I put um, yellow wood glue and water, a 50-50 cut of it. So it's just, you know, diluted with 50% water. And then painted the whole thing. And, and what I mean the whole thing, it's the whole thing. Um, when you're doing woodwork, you'll, you'll learn real quick that if you should coat one side and like seal it off, okay, and, and, it, can, and it can be a property of what you're putting on it, like this, you know, the, the water and the yellow glue, you put that on one side, that can make the wood swell or expand. Um, if I don't do that to the other side, that's not going to swell or expand the same as the one that I did put it on. And that can cause it to warp. You know, it'll kind of do that because one side's not swelling and the other side is. That's not where it ends. Later on, after it completely dries, it's quite possible that that swelling will retract as it dries. And so it'll retract. And then you've got a sealed side of your wood. And then you've got an unsealed side of your wood. Now humidity in the summer hits your, hits your wood project, okay? And the humidity in the summer is going to affect the side. Remember the side that didn't cause the warp last side, the dry side, but it didn't get any finish on it? Well, now this side that had the finish, you know, that caused the warp the last side. Well, now because this side that doesn't have any finish is getting moisture from the air, it's going to swell. And it will cause it to buckle or possibly move. So this is just something that you, you, you learn about wood. Specifically MDF, because MDF is, is particles. It's almost like paper. It's basically like cardboard. But it does have particulate in there. And, and so each of those little pieces of wood can swell. So we just want to be careful of that. That's why I say, if you're going to put a finish on your wood, put it on everything. Do the whole thing. And then everything can swell and retract as it's wet and, and dries out at the same rate. And then once it is dry, the entire surface of your MDF is now coated. And so it will absorb, because it'll still absorb moisture through the air, even through the paint. But it'll do it at an even rate because the inside and the outside has already been painted. Okay, so that being said, that's why I coded it. Did it work? Yes. Did it work the way I wanted? No. Because uh, when I was doing it, what I didn't get was complete uh, seal on the edges. And I don't know if I have any, yeah, see, I don't really have any pictures of the edges. Maybe this corner, you can kind of see it, but on the edges, some of that is still kind of rough. And by rough, what I mean is, the, the fibers of the material, the MDF, is not laying down. And so it's not smooth like the outside here is. It's, it's quite smooth. Now, it still needs to be, I mean, it's smooth, but it's kind of like, you know, uh, orange peel. So it's a little bit rough, but it's, it's smooth and it's hard. Whereas this, it's not because some of those fibers didn't absorb the paint enough so that they're nice and smooth. So I have to take care of that. When I was online this week, a gentleman, uh, texted in, use shellac. And I thought, 
That's awesome. Shellac is another good way to do it um, because shellac uses um, alcohol as a base and shellac won't make the, the wood swell like water does. So I love that suggestion. Another gentleman commented, um, he, he does construction and he says when he's using it, he will use uh, mud, you know, mud compound on the edges of it. And he lets that. I think that's another one. I just didn't have any of that. I do have some shellac. So next time I'm going to try shellac. And I will tell you how it works. Now, this will work. This is not ruined or anything. I mean, it's just a little bit more sanding. That's all it is. But it would be nice to find a newer technique that, that I don't have to go through those secondary steps. So that's what I will look at next time. Okay. So now we are ready to look at Mike stuff. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da. So let's do this. Um, Mike from mix uh mix studio sent me in and man mike i'm so sorry i have got to look up your email real quick because i forgot to do that and i want to make sure i can read it here we go so while you guys are looking at mike's picture i want to read what he said i'm so sorry mike i should have i thought i had prepared i had not obviously uh, I'll be right back. No, not right back. I'm just saying, here it is. Okay, Bill, some photos attached of some of the one sixth scale G.I. Joe size dioramas for figures, World War I trench section, home made barbed wire, sandbag boards, etc. metal sign fashioned after photo of original Imperial War Museum from metal toothpaste tube material. World War I Periscope, which I'm really super excited about, and I'm going to show you that here real quick. Uh, I should be rolling through these pictures, sorry. Um, this is the Periscope that Mike made. It's very cool. I really have a thing about Periscopes. I want to build a Periscope really bad, and Mike did just an awesome job here. This is a 1 6 scale. I want to do mine in 1 35th, of course, but I really like what he did here. Um, this is the sign, and I'm sorry, it doesn't show up uh, good here well here it doesn't come out great here we'll put it like that uh but it looks great i'm telling you the picture he sent me it looks really really nice and he sent me the picture of the one from the museum and it looks fantastic here is some of his uh his work in the trench and the woodwork looks fantastic uh and that's really fun this is from one of the one sixth uh the the bar scene that he made uh made this little buoy knife and uh, that is very, very cool. I like it. And uh, I believe that Mike made all of these, uh, even the leather work, which is really fun. I've tried to do leather work and um, it's super hard. Um, so there you go. There you go. And now these are uh, these are inductees now into Oscars fan club. I'm sorry, Mike. I don't I didn't get a name for these little lovely little ones, but uh, they are. Absolutely. I got to get out of here. I'm trying to get over here to see the comment section. But these um, little guys um, are part of Oscars fan club. Let's go back here. And this little guy. Look at that guy. What a sweetie. Okay. So last, almost last thing I want to talk about is this week and a half ago or something like that. I got invited to be on the Just Making Conversation podcast. And so I, I had a wonderful time talking to Malcolm and James. And if you don't know their podcast, it's really fun because um, both modelers, I believe James does uh, dioramas as well. And um, it's neat because when when I'm doing it, I'm talking to modelers and, and we're talking about model building and and, you know, if you've watched a few of my stuff, nothing new, you don't have to watch, but you should watch it for them because they're really funny and really nice. And it's a really great podcast. So it's out of the UK. And so that is uh, is coming up Monday, the 18th, next Monday, this coming Monday at 09 GMT. And so, and then there's also uh, their Patreon account because um, they, they have great podcasts and they're also part of a group of podcasts out there. You know, I've been on the um, Plastic Posse podcast so far and also Black Rifle Model Works was really fun too. So it's really fun. I am not a, I was not a podcast listener, right? Totally wasn't when I got into this, but now it's really fun because 
I'm also not educated in model building, if that makes sense. I didn't grow up with it like other people. There's a lot of names of great modelers that I don't know. I know Shep Payne. That's that's the guy. I know, you know. Now I'm starting to know a lot more, certainly. But I didn't grow up with that knowledge. And it's fun because these gentlemen did. And they've been doing it for years. And so when I listen to these podcasts and they're bringing people on and they're, they're talking about the craft and they're talking about ideas and how they see stuff, number one, I learn, which is brilliant. But number two, it gives you ideas and a way to think about something that maybe you thought about you'd solved, right? Like there was a certain technique or, I, you know, whatever, and you, you put that away because you solved it and you work on something else you haven't solved. Then they have a great idea about a better way to do it. I just love that. So if you're not a podcast listener while you're modeling, um, you should really give it a shot. It's a lot of fun. Um, uh, both Malcolm and James were fantastic and, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, I think you would like it too. So that is coming up Monday and then it'll replay as well. And it's also on uh, like iTunes and all that kind of jazz. So that's kind of neat. Um, and then I have my patrons. Uh, okay, so now today is uh, uh, really special because it's the third Friday of the month, which means that all my patrons, well, all my paid patrons can be in a live build. Um, so what I do is each third Friday of the month, I do a live group build. And it's open to all paid patrons, no matter what the level. If you're at the top level, it's every Friday. We do it every Friday, right? Um, and it's three hours. It's 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And it's a lot of fun. Um, I've also been putting stuff, more stuff on my patron channel. So there's more things to see. And you can now be part of patron without paying. And I just have to figure out, you know, what I, I have for this group and that. Group. It's kind of a pain. But it's kind of fun, too, because I can have different levels for other stuff because there are levels where I work with you one on one. And it's not just me hammering on. It's you're on the screen, too. And we're talking back and forth on stuff. So that's a lot of fun. So my patrons are John Robeck, Evan Davies, Daniel White, Scott Gentry, Stephen Robbins, Neil Maker, uh, Mark Doremus, Joshua Scott and Ryan. And, and like I said, I've got a. a, a uh, a few others, too, that uh, are not paid, but um, I don't have them up here. So I'm sorry. But they're really cool, and I really appreciate you coming over and checking that stuff out. And you can do memberships now on my YouTube channel. You can do a member. You can do thanks. You can do all kinds of different stuff on it. So that's kind of cool. Um, it's part of the monetization process that I was trying to go through this week. So I've got some more comments here. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da. I've got some wood carving knives that work great. Bill, watch out. You're done. Okay. So Neil says, I've got some wood carving knives that work great for carving plastic. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing. When you get into a wood carving knife or a wood carving uh, chisel or, or, or implement, whatever, a lot of those use a little bit higher carbon steel. I have for years had like these things and stuff like that and, you know, flexible knives and stuff, but it's really nice to be able to use something like this and it's not going to flex, right? This is a thick piece of steel. And when I'm using it, it don't move. So you know exactly where that blade's going to go. There's no flex on it whatsoever. And that's a little bit different experience with, you know, with these hobby knife blades or whatever you're using. So it's, it's nice. I, I think you would might like it. So yeah, check them out. Um, mine is covered with mud. There you go. Um, I like the mud on yours. So what he's re referencing, of course, is Mike's, um, uh, his, his trench. And I want to do like Neil did. And, and you're going to be able to see him if you haven't seen him already. Um, Neil has mud everywhere and it's awesome because the, the like one of the very first pictures of his World War One diorama I saw was of the duck boards and you're looking at the duck boards and the mud with them and then the like the steps across the duck boards, man, it looks like real. It just looks real. So yeah, super cool. Really dug it. So I just, I just really, you know, thought it would be really cool, but I really like the woodwork and how, you know, you're simulating the woodwork like Mike did. That was really cool. 
Lily and Lacey. So Lily and Lacey are officially in the Oscar fan club, and he is a fan of Lily and Lacey too. Um, I don't know where he's at now. Oh, he's right over here. But yeah, Oscar is 20. And so he's got his own deal going on, you know, but uh, that was very cool of you sending him. Uh, if you're a cat lover, you're in, you're good in my book. Um, okay. Well, folks, I think that's about it. Holy cow. It's been like a little while that we've been on today. And I really appreciate you sticking around. It was an awful lot of fun for me. And I hope you got fun stuff like figured out for this weekend. Um, I've got uh, a meeting tomorrow uh, that I'm going to go to Amps Seattle. It's their monthly meeting. And if you haven't checked it out and you're in the Seattle area, um, check out Amps Seattle. It's a great, great club. And though it focuses on armor, there's a lot of subjects in armor, you know, and, and that's what Amps is about. It's the armor... Uh, Armor Model Preservation Society, I believe is what it is. Um, I'm not a member, but I'm a member of the club and I really like it. It's got a different judging system, though I'm not into competing, but it has a different judging system and it's about you. And it's about your skills and your improvement and improving your skills as you build, which I'm huge into. I love that. So yeah, AMPS is really cool if you haven't checked it out. I'm also an IPMS member. And I love IPMS. Uh, there's a little bit of weird stuff going there, but I love IPMS. Um, and I'm also a member of Northwest Scale Modelers. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Fantastic modeling groups. And so if you're not in a modeling group, and I say this a lot, um, maybe check it out. My skills as a modeler doing this kind of, you know, in my shop for who knows how long, um, I thought I did pretty good, right? I, I learned modeling on my own, looking at magazines, looking at videos, maybe, and stuff like that. But when you're able to interact with another modeler, you know what you're talking about. Oh my goodness. It's amazing. And it's wonderful online. Don't get me wrong. Online modeling is fantastic. And I've really enjoyed that and doing online builds and doing group builds and things like that. And even just the, the comments and the texts and all that kind of stuff. It's really wonderful. And, and, and I think it's a wonderful thing if you don't have the chance to get to a meeting. But if you can go to a meeting, sit with people that you have this commonality with and just enjoy each other's company, your ideas about modeling and, and maybe for future projects or just remembering old modelers that maybe aren't here anymore. I got to tell you, it's, it's a pretty special thing. So look for a club locally. Um, if you can't find a, a club locally, look for a club online. There's lots of clubs that have, uh, you know, Zoom sessions and Zoom meetings. There's a lot of community out there and it's a lot of fun. So I, I'm going to start sounding like I'm preaching or something and I don't want to. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I hope you get a little bit of chance to do some modeling too. We'll see you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.